So welcome everybody um, to Planet in Crisis. So this is the inaugural Scientists Warning pre-COP um, organized by Scientists Warning Europe to drive action now on the climate crisis and on the way to COP26. Now, we know that humanity has delayed, prevaricated, put off and tried to not take any real action on the climate crisis for a very long time. We now need comprehensive, coordinated work to put it right now, and we cannot wait any longer. That in essence is the core theme of the three scientists warnings. The three scientists warnings papers all share an urgent call to act now and provide in the broadest terms the actions that we need to take to do that. This though may not even be the most powerful element of the scientists warnings. The thing that is most striking about these papers is the sheer number of scientists that have endorsed them. The original paper published in 1992 had 1,700 signatories, including more than half the Nobel Prize winners at the time. That is all the more impressive when you consider that that is in the days when email was in its infancy. The subsequent and much more recent warnings have now been signed by more than 20,000 and more than 15,000 signatories, scientist signatories respectively. In terms of something called outmetric scoring, that is the amount of interaction online through blogs, through policy papers, media articles that these warnings have had. Um, the warning in 2017 that Professor Bill Lawrence will discuss is, is in the top 1% of papers from its time period and the top 5% of papers published throughout the whole time. Professor Bill Lawrence, in giving his keynote address in a few minutes, we'll talk in much more detail about the 2017 paper. But I want to put into context the 1992 paper. This article, initiated by the Union of Concerned Scientists, started with a stark but clear introduction, and I will quote, human beings and the natural world are on a collision course. Human activities inflict harsh and often irreversible damage to the environment and on critical resources. If not checked, many of our current practices put at serious risk the future that we wish for human society and the plant and animal kingdoms, and may so alter the living world that it will be unable to sustain life in the manner that we know. Fundamental changes are urgent if we are to avoid the collision our present course will bring about. The cadre of top scientist signatories then went on to cover all the reactions required and they mentioned the places it was needed, the atmosphere, water resources, oceans, soil, forests, and living species. And they told us that the damage we were inflicting on the planet is irreversible on a scale of centuries or permanent. They mentioned that CO2 from fossil fuel burning and deforestation may alter climate on a global scale. Predictions of warming with projected effects range from tolerable to very severe, but the potential risks are very great. Well, now we know better. We know that there are only going to be now severe risks or total chaos, and we need to put that right. They specifically mentioned world population growth as a major problem. 5.4 billion in 1992. They reminded us that Earth and its resources are finite. In the short quarter of a century since that warning, our population has grown a colossal 45% to 7.8 billion and continues to grow at 200,000 people every day, more than double the capacity of Wembley Stadium. And in fact, every month, the population of London is recreated on the planet. Faced with these grim facts, the 1700 scientists concluded with the warning, we, the undersigned senior members of the world's scientific community, hereby warn all humanity of what lies ahead, a great change in our stewardship of the earth and, our, and life on it is required. 
if vast human misery is to be avoided and our global home on this planet is not to be irretrievably mutilated. When I first read this warning and the subsequent 2017 warnings, it seemed to me that the scientists had given their prognosis just like a doctor giving his diagnosis. I've gone to the doctor because I'm sick and the doctor has told me that I'm gonna die in a year's time if I don't give up smoking and drinking. But I ignore the doctor. And six months later on in more ailing health, I go to the doctor again. And the doctor says, just as I told you before, you will die in six months time if you don't give up smoking and drinking. I still don't believe them. So I go off to Harley Street and pay an expensive doctor to give me another diagnosis. And I'm told exactly the same thing. Well, most of us, when given that kind of diagnosis, would take action. Five of us would give up smoking and drinking. Four of us might smoke or drink a little bit on a Saturday afternoon. And one might be bloody minded and continue. But we'd all make a decision. And currently we haven't. That's why we formed Scientists Warning Europe. We're here to drive awareness of these massive scientific warnings to humanity. Papers that are as influential as the IPCC and UN reports, and not because they contain hundreds of pages of science, but because they bring the facts to the fore and they are signed off by tens of thousands of scientists, letting us know that the science is absolutely clear. Scientists Warning Europe is driving for action based on the science, now and in the future action at COP26, and we particularly want to make sure that it's all based on the science. Now, Caroline Lucas, President Macron, and Greta Thunberg said that our house is on fire. It is. Think of the Amazon, of California, of Australia, of Siberia. Yes, it's truly on fire. But think of our own personal situation. We've woken up. We've smelt the smoke. We know the house is on fire, but no one else in the house has woken up. So we go into the next room and we wake them up. We get everybody and we stagger hand in hand, shaking towards the stairs. We go down the stairs, we get to the hall in our house and we reach then for the door to try and escape outside. But it's locked. Scared, we move into the living room fumbling in the smoke to try and find the windows. We try to open the windows to get out, but they're locked. So then we turn around to face the fire because there's no choice. There's no plan B, we can't go anywhere else. And we do everything we can to put it out. We throw the dirt from the plant pots on it. We turn on the taps, we put the blankets over it. And if we're lucky, we manage to put the fire out, but we're left with a blackened, smoking, stinking home that we have to start repairing. Well, that's where we are now. And that's why Scientists Warning Europe is driving for action and why we put on this big pre-cop. So please do go to a lot of the other events. And now I'll move to introduce Professor William Lawrence. So Bill Lawrence um, is a patron of Scientists Warning Europe for which we're very, very thankful. And he was a co-author of the World Scientists' Warning to Humanity in 2017. He's a distinguished research professor and Australian laureate at James Cook University in Cairns in Australia. He holds the Prince Barnard Chair in International Nature Conservation at Utrecht University. Bill is an environmental scientist whose work spanning the tropical world includes 600 articles and eight books. He's a fellow of the Australian Academy of Science and the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences. He's received many professional honours, including the Heineken Environment Prize and the Zoological Society of London's Outstanding Conservation Achievement Prize. He's a director of the Centre of Tropical Environmental and Sustainability Science at James Cook University and founded the Alliance of Leading Environmental Researchers and Thinkers, a science outreach group that reaches one to two million readers weekly. He's a four-time winner of Australia's Best Science Writing Award. Bill has also been involved in action. Bill is action oriented just like we want to be at Scientists Warning Europe. He's been involved with a number of scientific societies in opposing new roads and oil projects inside Ecuadorian protected areas, 
slowing the pace of Amazon deforestation, limiting rapid expansion of industrial logging in Guyana, halting illegal colonization of protected areas in central Amazonia, promoting designation of the heart of Borneo network of protected areas, opposing tropical deforestation for expansion of biofuel feedstocks, and promoting international carbon trading for forest conservation. There really can be no one better to talk about science-based action and about the scientists' warnings to humanity. So, Bill Lawrence, thank you, and over to you. Ed Gimmel, thank you very much, and thank you to your colleagues at Scientists Warning Europe. Uh, it's exciting to see something like this um, flowering and proliferating and taking off the way it appears to be uh, doing. And it's uh, really gratifying to me as a scientist to see that this kind of stuff is starting to get the kind of traction and the kind of attention uh, that is just absolutely critical and fundamental to seeing, <clears throat> well, us having any kind of sustainable future at all. Um, now, Ed asked me to say a little bit about this uh, paper that uh, we did in 2017, uh, how it came about and, and some of the perspectives that we had at the time. Uh, I have, we have to start off by saying uh, enormous credit to Professor Bill Ripple at Oregon State University. Now, Bill is the guy who had the light bulb that went off over his head and said, wow, it's almost 25 years since this earlier warning by scientists in 1992 that gained a lot of attention. And uh, yeah, I think he thinks, you know, he thought there might be an opportunity to try to uh, build on that and, and uh, pivot on that and try to look at environmental changes since that time. Um, and Ed explained very well the sort of the background and history of that, er of that first initiative and the fact that it had 17, 1,700 scientists that had actually technically co-authored it, that had co-signed it which is an extraordinary number uh, back at that time. But it also gives you some sense of how remarkable it is that this, uh, the first paper that's come out in 2017 had about 15,000 signatories, technically co-authors, as Ed mentioned, and about 20,000 people altogether, including non-scientists. So it's the kind of stuff that doesn't happen very often in science. There's rare events occasionally that sort of snowball into this kind of galvanize this kind of action and this is, is the type of thing that we're seeing happening uh, with these with these papers so um, full credit again to Bill Ripple um, for I think really having the insight to see that there was potential here now and then what Bill sent me was a draft and it had if I recall right I think it had just North American authors on it and as I read it although Bill's worked a great deal internationally. Um, I thought that our group uh, at James Cook University is very international. Uh, the center that I direct has people working in more than 40 different uh, tropical nations um, around the world. So we have a lot of geographic uh, experience and diversity. And so we really looked at this draft manuscript in that light and said, you know, how would someone in the Congo Basin feel reading this? Say someone from the DRC, how would someone from Brazil living in the Amazon, feel about, you know, reading these words. And uh, we felt it was really important to try to mold and shape this into a document that wasn't just impactful in terms of its science, that in some sense, the science and the environmental crises that it reflects is so urgent that it's, you know, it, it, this kind of uh, article just carries along on its own. But to try to have the right kind of approach, and as I, you know, it is really important how we say things and what we say. So it was essentially just sort of bringing in the sensibilities and the language and the geographic variety. And then also, um, it turned out in my lab, uh, Bill was interested, well, I, I suggested to Bill that there be a, more of a ge geographic variation in our uh, co-authors. And so we brought in a, uh, somebody from Africa and Nigeria somebody else from the Amazon and somebody else from Indonesia, Southeast Asia. So we sort of covered that and had a much more diverse uh, set of authors. Um, you know, it, it's interesting when you go back and you read the, the original, the 1992 warning, at least the part that was, that you that got the primary uh, attention, you really do see how far 
thinking and sophistication has come, scientific thinking has come, especially about things like climate change. I mean, I, you, to me, it was interesting seeing, seeing it in that 92 warning and then seeing how we are thinking about it today and realizing how far the science has come, how many different new insights that we have about things. Um, it doesn't imply that there's still not uh, very large uh, challenges scientifically and uncertainty scientifically. I'm a personal believer that we've got to be very careful to state our uncertainties and to be upfront about those things because if we don't, we take we risk getting ourselves into trouble and, and getting in hot water. And I think that can be a real problem. So we want to you know harness our credibility and and really use that as a powerful tool. Um, so again, the, the, the 1992 warning set this stage, uh, and and we were able to harness that with a with a 25 uh, year later 2017. Uh, warnings. There were uh, several papers, and then there have been a number of subsequent papers, although, as, as Ed mentioned, sort of two main works following up. Um, in terms of, yeah, I think that one of the things that, as a scientist, I think our knowledge, our understanding um, of the way the world works, and, you know, we've had, since that first paper was published, 25 years of concerted research to try to understand not just how drivers like climate change or habitat destruction or pollution or habitat fragmentation or you know many a whole panoply of other kinds of environmental changes, not only how those types of changes affect ecosystems and biodiversity, but also how they can interact and potentially amplify one another and interact synergistically. So we can see, for instance, land use change in the Amazon where you're getting habitat destruction and deforestation and fragmentation of the forest interacting with apparent climate change, whether it's, it's unclear whether it's a region, regional scale drivers or global scale drivers, but we're seeing major changes in, in the ecology and the ecosystem functioning of the Amazon that's interacting with fragmentation to make forests, fragmented forests, much more vulnerable to fires. Uh, than they would have ever been historically. And the fire is just a devastating uh, kind of uh, disturbance uh, for tropical ecosystems, the most biologically rich ecosystems on the planet. So I, you know, there's, we've learned a lot. And in many ways, I think what we've, what this kind of uh, juxtaposition of this 1992 warning with the 2017 warnings is this, is that we may have uh, solved some of the scientific riddles, but we have not yet been able to surmount the tremendous political and social and other challenges that humanity needs to, needs to surmount in order to be able to get on top of global scale challenges like climate change, like global warming. Um, we, the science has advanced, the, the, the success um, let's just put it this way, we have many, many challenges still, and we ha have not, to my knowledge, yet come up with any sort of magic formula for being able to get policymakers to suddenly change the way that they're thinking and the way that they're behaving. Um, although these kinds of event, these kinds of political and social um, events, like the scientist's warning, like um, some of the young people's uh, 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 warnings, the Extinction Rebellion, Greta Thunberg's uh, work, uh, the Fridays for Future uh, movement. There's been a number of movements that are that are trying to advance environmental and nature conservation and sustainable development for humanity. Um, but I think there's, uh, we face tremendous challenges. Um, yeah, I think overall. Uh, you know, this, the 1992 paper was certainly an important one and it reflected the top thinking at the time. If you were gonna publish it again today, well, in fact, as we did in 2017, there were clearly differences and in, in, uh, in, in uh, the things that are emphasized. I think if, if when somebody's gonna do another one of these, perhaps in another decade or two, there'll certainly be new environmental threats that haven't been talked about. And one, one of the obvious ones would be pandemics. And that's something, of course, that's affecting all of us in many ways, in ways that probably won't become clear uh, for quite a long time. 
But to come back, scientists warning is a very important initiative. Uh, and it's a right time and there are critical opportunities and enormous challenges and especially in the realm of climate. But of course that interacts with just about everything else relating to land use change and pollution and human overpopulation and uh, environmental devastation at just about every level. Um, we are facing a time of great challenges. We don't want to be so strident in um, uh, decrying these problems that we turn people off. We need to talk in a way that engages people and it gives them hope and inspiration. And that's something, something that I hope uh, Scientist Warning can do as it's thinking about and moving forward. So thank you. Great. <clears throat> thank you very much, Bill. Um, I think we can uh, now move to questions and it may be now worthwhile actually allowing people to turn their videos on as we haven't had that many questions coming in through the chat. So maybe people might want to then interact directly. So if the videos are turned back on and if people could just stay um, muted um, while they're not talking, and once your videos are on, if you could raise your hand to ask if you want to ask a question in person. If not, please put it in the chat. So, okay. Um, and in fact, I'd probably just pick up straight away on the um, bill, just to ask if you could expand a little bit on the education side, a bit of a debate, particularly when you look at what Extinction Rebellion has been talking about and others, as to whether or not we should go for total doom and gloom in order to spare action um, or to take the we can still do it let's be positive and go for it and I suppose noting our own favorite in the UK David Attenborough he has rather moved over the last five years from a very positive we can do it attitude to his latest film on the BBC entitled Extinction in which he still brings in his line of we can still do it but it's much more thinly um, presented now than it used to be. Whereas he mm -hmm. used to present that as the most important thing, we can all do it. He's now presenting, we're at the last second um, and we need to act now. So mm -hmm. which, is, which is the way to do it? The Extinction Rebellion way or the more positive way? Well, it's a good question. Ed, and I, I, you know, I wish I had um, a, a clear answer on that one because I, I, let me say this. Throughout my career, I think I've probably been guilty of being sort of a, more of a doom and gloom type person. Um, and uh, it's not really intentional. It's just that it's the reality of what's happening when you're dealing with, you know, say, for instance, tropical ecosystems that are being devastated by human land uses or climate change or whatever. Um, but, uh, you know, there are, there are other people that they'll also argue, uh, Nancy Knowlton at the Smithsonian Institution has been leading a series of big conferences called the, um, er, uh, the uh, Earth Optimism uh, Conferences. And it's really based on this idea that we have to be optimistic. I was actually a keynote speaker at the first one of those they held. And there was a huge, it was a very big thing. And there was a lot of people there and it was remarkable to me that really the scientists or the people on the panels were pretty much doing what we always do, which was talking about problems and that type of thing. But um, I guess I'd just probably say this. Um, I don't think there's probably a single tactic. I wouldn't suggest that you know we need to be unified in, in terms of how we approach things. And there are gonna be some groups like Extinction Rebellion that are gonna find success in, in pushing a very hard, but uh, alarming, if you wanna call it negative message, Whereas there's others, um, other actors, I think that need to come in with, with the positive stories too. And we can't, I do think we need to be sensitive to the fact that, I mean, something struck me one time talking with my sister, who's a psychologist who lives in the US. Um, and I was talking to her about, um, uh, I, that's right, we do little videos for our research and we sent her a little video and I said, what do you think of that? And she said, well, it's too negative. She said, I just got all depressed and I didn't want to watch it anymore. So, you know, that's just a layperson giving you a frank answer about, about something that I, that I think we, as scientists, maybe do need to think about a little bit more. Ed. Yeah. I think it's worth in reading out actually one of the, the questions related. So from Julie Harrison, I talk to young people about climate change. They want action. 
I attend a lot of these events and see politicians talk. How can we demonstrate to the young people that action is being taken? Well, there's barometers, things that you can measure. I mean, a good example would be divestment. And, and you know, if you got, say, young people going to a corporation or going to a university uh, and saying, you know, uh, a bunch of your of your uh, endowment is uh, tied up in, you know, in, in uh, stocks for fossil fuels. And, uh, you know, so I, it's becomes apparent pretty quickly who's talking and who's walking, you know, and uh, yeah. I think if I would just add actually a little bit to, to that answer, the, um, when I've talked to young people about it, the thing that young people want to see the most is 40, 50, 60 year olds taking action because the young people can, in a way, they understand what's coming. They know that they're gonna to have to live it and they want those of us that are in positions of responsibility or influence to get on with it. And anytime they see somebody doing it, they are very, very thankful in the main. Um, okay, and then there's a question from Will Saunders. Um, how much individual action, i.e. diet change, reducing consumption, can work alongside industry? Um, and Will's mentioning that he hears that 100 companies are responsible for the most problems. Um, well, consumption's a huge issue, and the disparity of consumption, of course, and and... Um, I don't think anybody, particularly people in industrialized nations, you know, have to be very attuned to issues around gross overconsumption. And there's lots of from food, to energy, many other things, materials, all kinds of things that, that are being inefficiently used and consumed. Um, it's a whole, that's a whole conversation, you know, all by itself. But um, I think it's, um, it's a big issue. It's an important issue. Is, is trying to, and, and also people, again, in, in developing nations, you know, uh, when you try to, for instance, when we try to talk to people, um, somebody in say, for instance, uh, Borneo or New Guinea or Congo, um, and talking to them about their problem of, uh, you know, problems of environmental problems, habitat destruction, whatever, um, they're very fast in many cases to point out the hypocrisy of you being from a developing nation and who are you to, you know, to, to proselytize to us. And uh, you have to be, you know, we have to be very, very careful how we operate and how we deal with those kinds of things because people will get yeah, offside. There's a, there's a related um, question here from Paula McMahon, who actually is one of our speakers later on today. Um, and Paula asks, if we, the public, were to do one thing, what would you recommend that should be? Have you got a silver bullet you can recommend there, Bill? Yeah, well, I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's, the, there's the quippy answers you can say, like, um, and this is not, the, you know, say don't have children or something like that. But I mean, that's not probably the people, <laughs> many people listening here, the intelligent, uh, well-educated people that you probably do want them having children to carry on. Um, I would say uh, if there was a, a single thing, personally thing I would say is probably join an environmental NGO. And it, there's a range of them and some of them are really good. And there's some that are in countries and there's some of them that of course work internationally and globally. And I just think that I, I get questions like this from students frequently. And I think it's really good for them because it's a real eye opener. And also there's the, the NGO, excuse me, the non-governmental group, the organization, gives them regular updates on here's an important issue, here's an important issue, here's how you get involved. And the sad truth is most of us spend a great deal of time with sitting over a coffee talking about how flawed the world is and don't actually get out and do anything about it. So I think that uh, if you're going to do one thing, that's probably what I would suggest. And I just actually add to that, I had a, I've had a lot of conversations with people over the time and you hear everyone say, I'm doing my bit. Well, and I'm sure people on this particular event are actually doing a bit more than most, but it frustrates me and I keep telling them that that's not enough. You have to do a bit more every day and mm -hmm. keep going in whatever way. It's not just about saying you're doing your recycling, it's in keep ramping it up every day. 
Um, mm. You did actually mention there a topic which I know is of great interest to a number of people in Scientists Warning Europe and is also one of the thornier topics. So I'm going to lay it down for you to, uh, to maybe give some comments on. And that is population. Um, mm. and if I just introduce it, the, we know that population is linked to consumption. And often the arguments stretch that population isn't the issue, it's consumption. I'd like a comment on that. I think the secondary one about um, actions you can take of not having a child is clearly that might be a bit different. And I'm assuming, I'm just opening it up, might be a bit different if you're considering a British or an Australian family having another child compared to one in Africa due to the level of consumption that child would make. But I'll give you a, a third one, which has always occurred to me is that population is huge in terms of problem. Um, but the UN's given us 10 years to keep our planet under 1.5 to 2 degrees, which we already know is worse than today. And the greatest effects we can take in the next 10 years, um, would that be related to population or is population more of a medium term um, correction? And we have to take carbon reduction, for instance, as the number one issue for the next 10 years. Sorry, a bit complicated. I hope you got most of that. Yeah, the, the multi-part question there, Ed. Um, all right, let me see how, let, let me just take it one at a time and you may have to prompt me here. What do I feel is more important, population or consumption? Um, well, really, you know, I hate to punt on this, but uh, the answer is they're both really important. But I, yes, a lot of people are talking about consumption issues and those are critical. And we have to have a lot of people talking about population issues as well, because um, population is still obviously growing at an explosive exponential uh, rate. Um, the, the, the places where we're seeing the most explosive population growth are in developing nations. Um, and uh, these are nations that are gonna be uh, rapidly becoming the most populous and, and in many ways um, problem plagued parts of the planet problems with pollution, problems with political issues, with social stress, with international conflict, with um, immigration issues, migration issues. There's just so many different things that tie into population. Um, I see population as one of these really grand issues that has a tentacle in everything. I mean, it affects, uh, again, environment and environmental quality, but and societal stress, societal pressures, so many different things. Uh, happen as a consequence of that. So I would definitely, and I, Paul Ehrlich at Stanford University, of course, the famous population biologist was, uh, said to me one time uh, that, um, you know, the difference of a planet Earth between 10 billion and 9 billion could be incredible. It might not sound like that much, but that is just an extraordinary Dr extraordinarily dramatic difference. And I think, you know, if you look at the demographic models now, um, we're probably talking somewhere between 10 billion and 12 billion uh, people before the earth finally plateaus. And then it's a substantial time before it gets down to a, a lower number. So uh, population, yes, any way you look at it, Ed, uh, is gonna be a big, big issue. Now, sorry, you had a couple other follow-ons from that, I think. Um, I did, and I, and I think that this is, um is more one, particularly when we're talking about action today, is the oh, yes. UN has said to us, we've got 10 years to keep our planet under 1.5 to two degrees, which we all know is a lot worse than it is today already, if we're looking at forest fires or at anything else. Um, and if we are to take that action now, within 10 years and put it right, are any actions we would take in relation to population going to have any effect in that time? Or is that a medium term proposition? And we mm. must work on, carbon reduction, so emissions reduction plus sequestration um, in the short term. Yeah, the, the, the premise of the 10 year thing is an interesting question because of course the lifespan of a lot of these greenhouse gases is much more just off in, on order of centuries, but, uh, but anyway. Um, sorry, Ed, I'm just thinking about it. It's a little bit of a late hour here uh, in Australia. Will you just restate the question for me one more time real quick, and then I'll, I promise I won't do that again. I'm just Certainly, we all appreciate that it's very late for you, whereas for us, it's right in the middle of the day. Um, yeah. Yes, we're, we're, UN has set us 10 years to put things right. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Population's a big issue, but can it have any effect in those 10 years, or is it all yeah. about carbon reduction? Look, I don't think you can ignore population, not for a second, because we're setting into... Uh, 
into action critical trajectories that are that are going to take that are going to have long term effects now. So, I, for instance, I saw something uh, some years ago that, uh, that said that the most important policy thing that humanity had ever done to reduce global warming was China's one child policy. Okay. So that reduced literally the number of people. This is more than all of the other carbon abatement and carbon mitigation and off carbon offsets and everything else that we've tried to do to slow global warming in a policy level that was considered the most important. So it's interesting. I think it reflects there Ed, that this is not that population and environment are really integrally connected. And so I would say, yes, I think we actually have to think about, of course, emissions reductions. That's critical. And we can discuss and debate exactly how we how one does that. Uh, but I think one cannot ignore and look, and it's it's socially it's doing the right things that we want to do. Anyway, we want to see we need to see um, more education and opportunities for young women. I mean, women's education and, and, and those types of things are, are some of the most critical things we can do socially. And they will also have uh, fantastic benefits because they reduce they extend the uh, age of the mother before she has her first child and they give her career opportunities and it completely changes the whole demography and it moves a, a, a nation into the demographic transition, which is what we wanna see. So I'd say, well, I think we need absolutely, if I were living in Europe right now, I'd be pay, taking every spare dollar that I didn't put into the environment and putting it into family planning and women's education for uh, African nations. Because if you think there are immigration, migration issues and social issues and conflicts now, wait until Africa has four times as many people, because that's what the UN projects that it's gonna have at the end of this decade. Uh, four times as many, Nigeria will have 500% as many people as it does now. Nigeria already the most populous nation in Africa. So I think that the societal and environmental and economic and political and hu human related pressures coming out of Africa and the Middle East are gonna be phenomenally intense and getting a handle on population is probably the most effective way to try to, to lessen some of those uh, advancing pressures. Um Thank you. Um, moving on to, to a, a different topic now. Um, we've had a question coming, which I think actually is quite a lot of people here would be interested in, and it's from Gemma Rogers. A lot of people being activists in various local or national groups um, would like to know what is the um, one short paper or report that you would direct your MP or politician to? Now, I understand that maybe some different reports in Australia to hear, but I think reading in a bit into Gemma's question is, if you direct your um, MP who's pretty busy to United Nations reports on the IPCC, uh, they never get past the first two or three lines. Mm. Um, and then they're already befuddled and, and falling asleep. Um, and the, in any case, the summaries often don't um, bring out the extreme possibilities that might happen if we don't take action. So um, what would you direct your MP to if you were in Australia or the UK? Yeah, well, we've done, um, sorry, I'll, I'll make reference to my own work, and one could argue that there's lots of other science that one could, <laughs> could mention, but uh, anyway, um, you know, for instance, uh, I had a paper in Nature which really talked about the impacts of the global infrastructure and highway and road tsunami that's just exploding all over the planet and opening up many of the world's last surviving wild areas like, like flayed fish. Uh, so I think that would be the kind of thing I would probably direct someone to. It's, it's, I, in some ways, it's a silent um, crisis that's going on and, and people in the know are aware of it, but I think a lot of people just don't realize that we're roading and hydro damming and pipelining and power lining and, and just disrupting extractive industry our planet into submission in many places. Uh, so I think that that's a real crisis we need to talk about. Um, change of topic a little bit back to what we talked about before, but I'll, I'll read it out to see if you have a, a view on this. So uh, from Rosemary Boynton, um, what are the signs of hope and inspiration that we could refer to to temper any doom and gloom? And this for me is a little bit back to David Attenborough 
putting in his sugar lump in his extinction thing of we can still do this. Um, but what are the signs of hope and inspiration we can refer to to temper doom and gloom? Yeah, um, well, we published a paper a few years ago. It was lit, yeah, anyway, um, listing uh, a quite a number of rare and endangered species that had, had actually come back from the brink of extinction. Literally species in some cases that were just staring into the abyss and just maybe down to just a few handful of individuals and, and through management actions and human activities and conservation work um, had, had made comebacks or the situation had improved. Um, one example, something just very recently, a bunch of us have been fighting to try to protect the world's rarest great ape species. This uh, uh, orangutan recently discovered orangutan, the Tapanuli orangutan in Indonesia. And uh, it occurs in an area, only in an area uh, about a 10th the size of Sydney, Australia. And there's only under less than 800 uh, of the apes left. And it's being overrun by Chinese funded and sponsored development uh, there. And we've been fighting that. And it looks like we may be getting some traction after throwing an awful lot of uh, mud pies at these at these proponents um there's finally some some potentially good news there there is good news i mean if we look at the montreal protocol of course is the classic example in which um uh we uh there was a major action done on ozone destroying chemicals um you know i'm sure if one sort of sits and talks if we talk about environmental awareness if we talk about the number for instance if you go to a country like brazil you can see that they've had just a, a dramatic increase in the number of non-governmental groups that are working on environment or on indigenous rights. And that's something that just didn't exist, you know, a couple of decades ago, nothing like the numbers that you see now. So I think there's snippets of hope all over the place. And I, you know, it's, we, whether we are going to choose to be glass half empty or glass half full people, one of the real challenges that we all face is, is this simultaneous and it's vexingly difficult is how do we convince people that the problem is bad enough that we really desperately need to do something about it without having them think that it's so bad that they might as well just throw up their hands and say, it's all too depressing and I'm going to give up. And I, again, I don't, I don't really have the answer for that. I think it's something that uh, maybe we need to have more psychologists among us and, you know, people who are experienced marketers. I don't know. But, um, I'm trying to keep an open mind and I know there's plenty to learn, put it that way. And in fact, we've, um, I don't know if you know, Bill, but we're forming a communications advisory panel in Scientists mm -hmm. Warning Europe next to our science advisory panel specifically to address this. So, um, and I might bring an extra comment, knowing that the person who asked the, the last question to you actually is a lawyer, is that one of those places where there is action is in the law. Uh, I mean, there's obviously been the, um, the extra runway at Heathrow was stopped by the lawyers, I think, acting on behalf of Friends of the Earth, um, maybe temporarily, but it stopped for the moment. Um, there's been a case, Client Earth took a, a case in Poland and stopped um, a, a coal-fired power station um, being started there. And there are various other um, legal actions that are taking place. And so actual fact, there's direct action that's being taken under current laws. So and can be done straight away. Yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely. I do not, and things are being stopped all the time. I mean, and and it's sometimes it's just through attrition and and whatever projects get delayed and they get bogged down or whatever. In many cases, that's also a consequence of of activists and others that are raising you know concerns and objections about those projects. Um, for me, as someone who's spending quite a lot of time trying to think about global infrastructure this uh, avalanche of infrastructure is happening, I would say this, the good news is, is we're stopping some of the projects. And in fact, it's oftentimes some of the worst projects. Um, the bad news is there's just so many projects. This is a problem is it's just, you know, this fire hose and, and it's coming that fast. And I think that's a real challenge that scientists have to face is we, we need, I mean, scientists, I really do think are talking a lot about this modern infrastructure tsunami and what its implications are and how it's sort of spreading the human footprint all over the planet. Um, but um, we certainly have our challenge. Uh, one has to mention quickly the Belt and Road Initiative, China's incredible uh, 
initiative, which is going to range somewhere with investment between one and eight trillion uh, dollars and is going to be the largest economic project in human history. So this is uh, this is incredible in terms of the number. 130 nations are involved in this in terms of infrastructure expansion, roads, highways, dams, other kinds of things that are having tremendously serious environmental effects. Okay. Um, oh, am I? Hang on. No, I'm unmuted. Okay. Um, we have a, another one in. I'm actually going to read this from um, Stuart Gaunt. Um, a radio program in the UK, Costing the Earth Radio 4, suggested that deforestation is due to economic opportunity in Brazil. And the only way to stop the deforestation will be to stop importing products that are grown in deforested land. And Stuart adds, what actions are G5 taking to help? Any thoughts on that? Um... I'm thinking about the first one. Uh, sorry, these questions are. Oh, the. Uh, sorry, Ed. Just repeat the question to me. But it, can you just give me uh, when you have a multi-part question? Just give it to me one at a time, if you okay. could. I, I'll just do. By the time we get to the second part, I've, I've lost the first one. Yeah. Yes, do right. I think I think it's just comments on the first part is probably the main. Main point. So um, Stuart's saying that um, deforestation is due to economic opportunity in Brazil. So is our way to stop the deforestation is to stop importing products that are grown on those deforested lands? Yeah. Well, I'm thinking about that. I'm, I just have to, I mean, that's an interesting statement. So deforestation is a result of economic opportunity. I'm not sure I quite even understand that. Can you ask the lawyer to, to, Explain that a little more uh, in, in different words, because I don't quite get that. I mean, uh, isn't all economic, what would, what would be the alternative? Economic opportunity was not the... Yeah. I mean, I, I suspect that, the, that the really the question is saying, stop drinking soya milk if you don't want to see the deforestation that um, leads to soya being planted instead of forest. Yeah. I think also the question is being framed in a way that I'm not used to hearing. It's just a different, yeah, it's just not quite how we've been thinking about it. But because I'm sitting here thinking, I'm not sure I even agree with the premise of the question. And that's where I was stuck there for a minute was, um, yeah. But anyway, let's move on to the next question, if you don't mind. I'm happy to come back sure. to that one. Later, but sure. Yeah. OK, um, so from Brian McGavin, um, drawing on your specialist knowledge, on forest fire devastation around the world, are there key remedies governments can introduce now? Yeah, I mean, I hate to sound like a parrot repeating the same thing, but uh, what's happening right now in just about every frontier we look at, and whether we're talking about New Guinea, to Borneo, to Sumatra, to the Congo Basin, to the Amazon, to wherever else, wherever else you want to talk about, is that these areas of surviving intact habitats and intact forest are being penetrated by logging roads and by roads for uh, built by miners and, and, and by others, uh, by frontier colonists, by corporations, big mining corporations in some instances. And these roads are facilitating sort of a, are opening a Pandora's box of environmental ills when uh, you get colonists and others, um, illegal uh, colonists and others moving into these frontier areas, hunting, poaching, uh, causing forest fires, habitat fragmentation, habitat destruction. So I think that the common theme and the thing that I would try to, to identify is in fact these frontier roads. And many of them we actually think uh, have a poor economic uh, case. Uh, some of them are just being built for reasons that don't seem to be uh, clear to anybody, uh, but yet governments are charging ahead with some of these things. So I actually think some of the most dangerous things we're doing right now is just bulldozing. The current estimates suggest that we're going to have something like 25 million kilometers of new paved roads by the year 2050, which, which would be enough to go around the world more than 600 times. So an, an incredible more faster road building now than has ever happened in human history. Yes, right. Okay. Um, now I'm just going down on the 
questions. Yes, there is a, a question that came in, and I think it might be, I'll just paraphrase it um, from Geo Meadows. Um, and that is on the idea of the deep adaption. So um, I'd be interested to see if you'd like to comment on the idea of whether we should be looking at the, the doomsday scenario, thinking that it's all already too far gone for us to do anything about it and starting to adapt, or whether that is a negative and unproductive way of looking at it. Oh, okay. So this, and this also, of course, reflects a lot in terms of thinking about climate change. Should we be trying to, to adapt to uh, future climate change or should we be, or current climate change, or should we be trying to stop it? Um, uh, look, I think we're gonna have to adapt in some ways. I mean, it's naive and silly not to think that uh, some things are, you know, simply not going to be, um, that we, that some things, sorry, that we absolutely have to be willing to adapt. I myself am concerned that some people will hear that word adaptation and will will say, well, we don't need to make fundamental changes then, for instance, in our carbon emissions or in how much forest we're destroying or whatever, um, because we're gonna adapt, because we have strategies out there that are designed to say, adapt to rising sea levels or adapt to increasing wildfires or adapt to increasing droughts, that type of thing. Um, it's clear whether or not a scientist, in fact, think it's a good idea or not, that society is going to evolve and change. And they're going to, as climate change um, exercises its, its um, dangerous grip on economies and, and on societies, that these things are going to happen. Um, more hydroelectric dams will be built in certain areas because some places simply won't have the water storage capacity that they, that they need. Um, there'll be other kinds of developments. There'll be all kinds of things that could happen. And some of which scientists might look at and say, that's not necessarily a very good thing, but it might be something that would be in the interest of, the, of a particular community. You know, for instance, in terms of having, as an example, more hydro storage and, and then being able to get through those summer months. So I guess um, adaptation is gonna happen, but um, I really, it concerns me that we that we just don't see adaptation as a as a replacement for the kinds of critical action that we've got to take to also try to uh, reduce the climate crisis and the, and the environmental crises that we're facing right now. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and there's um, and I can see the time just, Bill. Uh, looking at you, we're now reaching the one hour, um, and it's late for you. If you were happy, um, we might extend for another 15 minutes. If you felt that you, that was too much for you, we would close it in the next minute. How do you feel? As long as you don't mind me occasionally forgetting a question or something like that. And, the, <laughs> and I don't normally do that. So if this was 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock in the morning, say 11 o'clock at night, it would be different. Yeah, but anyway, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you very much from all of us. Um, in which case, then, there's a there's a sort of a comment from somebody which I like and then something related. And um, I'm going to remember to use this in a talk in the future. So from Rosalind Kent, um, when you're on the railway line and an express train is coming, you don't arrange a coffee morning to discuss it. So the and then Ken Huggins has come in and asked, I think, which is something which is um, very important. Um, how do we persuade the politicians and media to educate the public about the truth of the problem. I'm sure many people think the problem can't be that bad because if it was, the government would be telling us. So let me divide that up. Um, I think let's look at politicians. Um, so how do we persuade our politicians to tell the public how it is and to do something? Yeah, well, well I think we, you know, we need to be clear that the word politician is like saying a human being to a degree. I mean, I think uh, there's a tendency sometimes and probably in the UK and in Australia and other places to sort of lump all of our politicians as, as a, a particular thing. But, uh, you know, I think when we talk about politicians who are and what we can do to try to, to get them to... Uh, we have outreach to the public and convey the, the critical messages. There are some politicians that are doing that. And I mean, that's important to bear in mind. And some are, I mean, if we look at the, you know, some of them are, a few of them are really great. Uh, some of them are pretty good. Uh, some of them are okay. And then there's, you know, some of them are not good at all. 
and as there's just a, a, a lot of variability. So I would say we want to focus on electing the right people who are going to have the critical policies. And so vote, vote and, and engage become, you know, the public, I think, uh, can help to encourage politicians by being engaged in, and in, involved in a lot of issues. And, and um, you see it again and again, where one individual, one person gets a bee in their bonnet about a particular issue and they get other people involved and they turn it into a, a bit of a mini movement or something like that. And then they engage with politicians. One person can actually make a pretty big difference if they're willing to engage and get involved and, and, uh, and play in that arena. So I think that there's, we can, uh, we can certainly expect more of our politicians and we can encourage the good ones and vote for the good ones and, uh, and not vote for the ones that are not so good. Great, I think if, maybe if I could add to that actually a little bit of recent experience in the UK and I happen to know from the chat and I'm sorry it was put as privately at the beginning but uh, we're all learning on this so now that's that everyone can post to everyone. Um, and I know there's another parish councillor like myself on here from a parish council that's declared a climate emergency. Um, the politicians at all levels can be influenced. And in fact, what anybody on this call should consider doing is making themselves into a politician. Uh, most parish councils um, <clears throat> don't have enough councillors on them. And if you go and apply to be on a parish council, you can generally get on it. And that's an opportunity then to declare a climate emergency or take climate action. Um, in relation to um, county council elections, they're happening next year. Um, I heard in the recent um, Bucks Climate Action Group about what people are thinking of doing for it. The best thing people can do is stand and stand to get elected. But if you don't get elected, you spend mm. your time talking about climate change and about the problem in a hustings, in the newspapers and everywhere else. And, and I this is not a scientist warning Europe view. So this is now a personal view, having stood in the general election um, as an independent um, last year, where my only policy was to reverse climate change. And during that, I got up at the hustings, six or seven hustings in a row, some of them on radio, where I simply hammered about climate change as being the only and the most important issue facing us. And by doing that, I forced all of the other candidates to continue talking about it themselves. And in the end, the Conservative um, MP who won, who would have been considered by many as a climate denier before the start of the campaign and considered me as an enemy from the first hustings, at the end, he declared in front of the BBC cameras that we're all environmentalists and thanked myself and the chap from the Green Party for standing. So we've got to take action on the political level and it's not just voting, it's standing up. Stand in the council elections next year as an independent for climate change. And if you get thrashed and get one vote, feel happy because you've got the message across and the other people who get elected will have noticed it. So, and then we just have to keep going. So anyway, I just wanted to add in, Will, uh, Bill, uh, Bill, my experience on that one. Um, now, moving on to something which is, the. The big issue in climate change, I guess, and Judy Harrison has asked, is carbon capture and storage a short-term solution or something we may have to live, continue to live with for much longer? Well, I'm not really the person to ask that, but uh, my understanding is this. I don't think carbon capture and storage is gonna be, I mean, if you look at the magnitude of our global emissions now, and also the diversity of emissions, by the way, because we keep talking about uh, CO2 and there's lots of other greenhouse gases out there and uh, things like nitrous oxide that, uh, of course, uh, methane, uh, which can be very potent. Uh, but carbon uh, storage and, and capture, um, there are techniques that are being looked at now, uh, for instance, using... Um, Oh, I'm sorry, the name slipped my mind, but it's using uh, carbon that's um, bio, biochar, excuse me, biochar, for instance, where they're taking large amounts of, of, of charcoal and tilling it into agricultural fields. And there's a lot of potential uh, for that type of thing. There's other, t other technologies involved that could actually involve, obviously, direct extraction from the air and that type of thing. But um, my understanding is the technologies are, are, generally speaking, probably relatively expensive 
And uh, to, to apply them on a scale that would be globally significant would probably be uh, very expensive. Whereas um, trying to actually attack some of the causes of emissions and, and gradually decarbonizing in terms of industry, industries and societies and, and land use changes and other kinds of things which have a big impact. Um, I think we can't back off for one moment those efforts to try to slow emissions. Uh, and I'm just concerned, sometimes humanity, we seem to think that if we do one thing and it, it makes a positive contribution that, that we've now done enough. And I just fear that that carbon capture and storage technologies, unless it really is operating in a large scale, might end up being so expensive and, and potentially just a drop in the bucket. We have to wait and see. And, and I suppose that means that really it's stopping emitting is the most important. Then we don't have to worry about taking it out of the atmosphere. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, we've had a, somebody who'd like to remain anonymous ask you a question. I'm not sure either of us can answer it, but I'll, I'll, I'll give it and then maybe I'll start at least with something connected. Um, who's asked if we shouldn't talk to the Pope to convince him that contraception is not evil. Um, well, I, I can't quite answer that one directly, but I, what I would like to say is that the, the Pope, Pope Francis, chose the name of St. Francis of Assisi, the patron saint of the environment, as his name when he became Pope. And he has written Laudato Si, which is a, an absolutely seminal um, work in terms of influence on Catholics and Christians and others around the world related to the environment. And he, is, um, he actually states within that letter that he believes the scientists. And he believes that there will be wars about um, drinking water and that millions, if not more, hundreds of millions will be on the move. And he totally endorses the scientific view. So I can't quite mm. comment on his, you know, what he would say on contraception, but the Pope is really a big mover in trying to press us to do more on environment um, and climatic issues. Bill, I don't know if you have a comment as well. Well, just the Pope Francis is, is I think, one of the best popes we've had in a long time. And uh, I mean, he is a Catholic Pope with everything that that uh, construes but, or entails. But um, on the other hand, as a Catholic Pope, he's been a, really a remarkable uh, progressive in, 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 in a lot of levels. But there are some very fundamental elements of the Catholic Church and around contraception and, and abortion and, and some of these issues that are very uh, fraught and difficult issues, I think, for the church. Um, but I think that um, it is, it's wonderful that on the one hand, Pope Francis is so, seems to be so aware of what scientists are saying and thinking about the world, but yet there seem to be these, on the other hand, kind of just stark uh, inconsistencies. And one of the obvious ones is the contraception. And I just add for all those who are scientists warning Europe supporters that actually when we thought COP26 was going to be happening now, actually in the time we're talking, um, we had written to the Pope to try to bring him to COP26. And we had had a letter back from the Vatican um, saying that um, they were in the process of taking some actions. I don't think the Pope was intending to come, um, but we will try again with all of your help to encourage the Pope to come to COP26 um, next year um, he, is, he does get invited as a head of state anyway, but never comes to these things. But to see if we could get him to come maybe in a pre-cop session beforehand. Mm. Um, I think we're going to limit it now to probably just two more questions then, Bill, if that's okay with you. Um, and somebody's asked the, um, I think it was Stuart Gaunt, although I've now not got it in front of me. One of the questions that we hear often as climate activists, uh, particularly, I should think, I mean, in the UK, I heard it all the time during the election. I'm sure it's the same in Australia is if you go door to door and talk about the climate, people go, what's the point if China and America are not doing anything? Mm -hmm. I would leave that to you maybe in an Australian context because people must surely say the same thing in Australia. Oh, they absolutely do uh, in all kinds of situations. And it's, um, I, it's the ultimate cop out and you hear it all the time. And uh, you know, uh, the notion, for instance, here in Australia, you know, I've been in forums where people would say, well, we're only one or 2% of global emissions. It's trivial. You know, we can, we can cut our emissions by this and it's not going to mean anything. But on the other hand, you say, well, look, look, let's look at it at a per capita basis. 
And in fact, you see Australia is right up there. In fact, you know, Australia, Canada, uh, some of the Middle Eastern countries that are very uh, consumptive, um, the US, uh, you know, have the highest uh, uh, emissions in the world. And uh, yeah, I, well, anyway. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. There's a, an interesting small one here um, from uh, Bill Dowling. Does the climate emergency warning, so the world scientist climate emergency warning, supersede the second warning? Maybe a, a comment on how they're connected. Does it supersede it? Um, well, I think, it, I mean, in a sense it does. It's, it builds directly from it. And, and it's obviously designed both to take advantage of this fact that there was this 25 year uh, moment uh, happening, but also I think to build on the fact that there've been changes in our understanding. Well, there've been changes in environmental issues and there've been changes in our understanding and, and just in how the world works too. And so I think there are lots of little, there's lots of little subtle things going in there. So I, yeah, that word, I don't quite know what to say to that word supersede. I mean, to me, that would imply that the earlier warning isn't valid. And I would say, no, that's not the case at all, but it shows what the world was like, uh, you know, back in the early 1990s, where this is just uh, more recent. Okay. Um, I've seen a lot of people um, commenting about my comment on soya. I certainly wasn't saying that it was humans that were main cons um, consumers of soya, but more commenting about the fact of forests being cleared for soya. Um, clearly animal production is, I think it's 75% of the use or more of soya goes to animal production and humans I think are only, maybe it's only 10%, so maybe it's even higher than that, 90% to animals. So thank you for pointing that out, everybody. Um, right, I think we're, just going to answer if there's anything we can answer just quickly. Um, right, got so many other comments. Um, I think we'll now have to move on, Bill. So thank you very, very, very much. Um, that was absolutely brilliant. It was fantastic to have you here with us for the, the opening talk of our um, Scientists Warning Europe pre-COP Planet in Crisis. That was great. Um, while everybody's here, um, I'd like you all to know that there is another talk starting at two o'clock um, from Paula McMahon. If you go into the Planet in Crisis website, planetincrisis.com, you'll see on the events, in the second event, you've got Paula's event. And Paula's going to be talking from an engineer's perspective more about the actions that we can take uh, to put things right. Paula's actually on this um, talk at the moment watching. Um, but if you could please come along as well and look in on that. That's planned to be a much shorter event of only 40 minutes. I'm sure you can fit it in. Um, so uh, thank you very much, Bill. Um, that was a wonderful talk to get us started. Um, and thank you much, everybody, for attending. Please go and register for some of the other talks that are coming up. And I would mention particularly that we've got on Monday, it's Food Day. Um, we've got one of the authors of the... Um, I believe the second warning as well, Dr. Mahmoud is talking about an interesting satellite technology way of solving the food crisis in Nigeria. Um, we also have the founder of Pucca um, talking about how we can um, put right farming and food practices. Um, and then we have on the last day, on the 8th, we will have Professor Abil Mumau who is one of the authors of the World Scientist Climate Emergency Warning, um, who will be talking and focusing more on the last of the three main papers, the Climate Emergency Warning. So please come and join us for that as well. So thank you very, very much, everybody. Um, and goodbye. So thank you, Bill. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Good. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.